Why are we insisting on the word happiness? Because we're thinking long term here. We're thinking about a revolution in the way people think about the good life. A revolution in terms of the way people think and pursue life's ultimate currency. Happiness. Happiness studies as a field focuses on much more than positive psychology. In fact, it focuses on much more than psychology. It looks at what philosophers had to say about the good life and it looks at theology and neuroscience and history and economics and film and literature. What we decided to do at the Happiness Studies Academy is salvage happiness. In other words, help people understand the true, the deep, the real meaning of a happy life. Precisely to talk about the fact that a happy life is about pleasure and it's also about a sense of meaning and purpose in life and it's about relationships and generosity and giving and it's about intellectual well-being it's about learning and if we through education teach people that happiness is about pleasure and happiness is about meaning and it's about relationships and it's about physical health and it's about intellectual development when people truly understand that all these elements make up the concept of happiness then they will be more likely to pursue that more likely to attain it more likely to help others attain it more likely to create a better world hello everyone and welcome from wherever you are and whenever you are so i see people from brazil and the us and argentina and peru and germany and vietnam and uh, canada mexico italy the list goes on welcome all it's really great to have you here and um i must have been looking forward to the conversation that I, we are about to have for uh, a long time. I'm very excited about it. Uh, before I introduce our uh, guest today, um, just for those of you who are interested in listening to this in Spanish, or if later on you would like to ask your question in Spanish, we have uh, interpretation. All you need to do is go down, click below on interpretation, and then on Spanish, and you will uh, hear uh, Ivan's masterful translation. Um, this is how today is going to work. Uh, after I introduce uh, Adam, uh, we are going to chat for about uh, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, I have a, a list of uh, 126 questions, which we need to get through. And then, I'm going to invite you to ask questions. And the way you ask questions is once again, below on reactions and you click on that hand that's up and then we will call you and we'll get through as many as we can in about the same amount of time, that is 40 minutes or so. Um, so that's the plan for today. Without further ado, let me introduce Professor Adam Grant. Um, so, as an organizational psychologist, Adam Grant is a leading expert on how we can find motivation and meaning, rethink assumptions, and live more generous and creative lives. He's been recognized as one of the world's most influential <clears throat> management uh, thinkers and one of Fortune's 40 under 40. His PhD is in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan and his BA is from Harvard University. He's also the number one New York Times bestselling author of a number of books that have sold millions and millions of copies, been translated into 45 languages. Some of his books, Hidden Potential, Give and Take, and Power Moves. Now, many of the, those attending today are students of the Happiness Studies Academy. Um, 
you are very familiar with the work of Adam Grant. We read him in the various courses, uh, watch his lectures online, and uh, derive a great deal of benefit from his wisdom. So here he is today, live, Adam Grant. Welcome. Thanks, Tal. So happy to be here. Um, so Adam, I let me start with uh, my first of uh, 126 questions. Um, my first question is um, around what happened over the last you know 20 years in your uh, academic journey. What have you learned that you think is the most important about uh, flourishing? Something that you didn't know 20 years ago and today you do. Well, I feel like before I answer that, I need to give a little backstory on why I'm in a position to answer that. Um, I'm going to embarrass Tal, everyone, uh, because he played a pivotal role in my decision to go into this field. Um, it was almost 25 years ago that I walked into my first applied psychology class and heard that the TA was actually better than the professor, the head TA. Um, but I didn't get assigned to the head TA, who was Tal. So I invented a schedule conflict uh, and emailed him and said that I, I couldn't attend my current section so that I could be rerouted into his. And that turned out to be one of the most important decisions I ever made because um, Tal changed the way that I saw the world and convinced me that first, I wanted to become a psychologist, second, that I wanted to study work, and third, I wanted to try to follow in his footsteps and build a bridge between Tal, as you put it, the ivory tower and Main Street. And uh, without your influence, first in that class, and then as a mentor through the the three years we, we worked together after that, um, I would not be an author, I would not be a professor, uh, and I definitely would not be here in this Zoom. So let me just start by saying <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Very meaningful to me, Adam. And it's amazing that it's 25 years ago, but it really does seem like, uh, you know, a day or a week ago. Uh, I, I feel that way too. And, uh, you know, there's still, there's still major life decisions where I'm torn and I hear your advice echoing in my head and, and have clarity that I didn't have. Um, and I think, uh, I think actually that's a, that's a good place to begin on. Like, what, what do I know now that I didn't couple decades ago about flourishing. I think that one thing I've learned recently that I never really thought too much about before is that I think that, that flourishing depends on being able to toggle between living in the present and living in the future. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I think that for a long time, I thought that, that happiness was about present focus. Um, that was such a, a cornerstone of the work that we studied together on flow, on mindfulness, and yet, um, what I've learned over time is that people who live in the present um, don't set themselves up for flourishing in the future. Um, they don't set long-term goals. They don't make big plans. They don't pursue bold dreams. And obviously the opposite situation is not desirable either, right? I think people who only live in the future end up uh, with what Barry Schwartz would call a flat temporal discount curve, <laughs> where they're, or Talia, I think you put it much more eloquently when you said they, they never leave the rat race. Um, and they're, they're always pursuing something that's just out of reach. And so I think the ability to, to do a little bit of both, um, to live in the now, but also dream for the tomorrow is, is really important. And I, uh, yeah, I, I never really thought about that until recently. Huh. You know, um, Adam, one of the ideas that I think about a lot um, is uh, something that I encountered literally decades ago in the book by uh, um, Collins and Porras, Built to Last, where they talk about that one of the characteristics of great organizations, what they call visionary organizations, is that rather than um, succumb to the tyranny of the or, they embrace the genius of the and. And, uh, you know, they talk about it in the context of organizations. I think it applies as much uh, if not not more so to the individual. And what you're describing here is the genius of the end between present and future. How can you reconcile uh, the two? Yeah, I, I think that's well put. And I think you're right. There's a larger principle at play here, um, which Esther Perel is always reminding me. Like some of the tensions and dilemmas in your life are not problems to be solved. They're paradoxes to be managed. 
Mm -hmm. And our, our longtime colleague, Wendy Smith, I was with her yesterday and she was talking about how every single important decision in your life is a paradox. Um, and it's very tempting to say, look, there, there are trade-offs and I just have to choose one over the other. And the reality is um, if you recognize that there are always going to be conflicts between whether it's present and future, competition and collaboration, success and happiness, um, make your list of your favorite tensions. Um, those don't just go away. You don't just choose one and forget the other. You have to figure out how to hold them in dynamic tension, which I think is easier said than done. Yeah. And, um, you know, it takes me back to uh, one of the most influential uh, concepts and classes that I've ever encountered. And that is uh, Joseph Badaracco from Harvard Business School, who talks about decisions. And he says, you know, deciding between right and wrong. Yeah, it's, you know, straightforward maybe not easy, but, but accessible. The difficult decisions that define what he calls the defining moments in our lives have to do with right versus right decisions. And, uh, and again, it's, you know, focusing on the present is right. You know, planning for the future is right. Um, how do you bring the, the, the two together, create uh, Hegel's synthesis between the thesis and the antithesis? This also, we're just going to spend the whole time quoting thinkers we admire, aren't we? But I, I do have to say <laughs> that this reminds me of something that, that Ellen Langer, I think, impressed on both of us when we were in her lab, when she would, she would say, anytime you're struggling with a decision, um, it means that there are probably either multiple great options um, or multiple equally desirable options. And so instead of agonizing over making the right decision, make a decision and then invest that energy in making the decision right. And I thought that that flip from make the right decision to make the decision right um, was great guidance. And I feel like every time I regret a choice, um, and I, I think that's a pretty frequent occurrence for me where I feel like, you know, I teach, I teach hindsight bias, but it doesn't shield me from experiencing it. I'm like, oh, I, I should have, I should have thought differently about that decision. I'm, I'm really disappointed that I made it okay, well, I've committed. I can't change it now. I can't undo it. How am I going to turn this into a good decision? Mm. Love it. Um, so let's move to the organizational level. So a lot of your work revolves around uh, organizational flourishing. Um, so what advice would you give today? I know there's a lot of advice that you would give, but just some of the fundamentals that you would give for organizations who want to create an environment where their employees flourish? Well, I actually think this is a great place to apply the paradox lens, because I think in organizations where people don't flourish, um, performance is, is the number one value and everything else is secondary. And I think this is, this is sort of, I guess this is something that that swings a little bit like a pendulum. So we know that when economies get good, um, human relations becomes more important. There's a lot of evidence that companies start to care about their people more when, um, you know, when marketplaces are more competitive and it's harder to recruit talent. And then, you know, things get tight and that sort of falls by the wayside. And what I'm constantly putting pushing leaders to do is to say, I don't want you to value excellence less. I just want you to value your, your people's well-being on par. Because in the long run, you can't sustain excellence if you don't treat people well. And the way that, that you treat people, the respect that they have, um, the, how meaningful their jobs are, um, how motivated they are to come to work every day is an important long-term indicator of the future success of your company. And there will be moments when you have to choose between the two. Um, there will be individual decisions where you ask people to work a late night um, and you might be precipitating a little bit of burnout. Um, but you're doing it because a client has an urgent request. And I'm not objecting to those moments. I'm saying if you always choose the late night, every time that happens, then you are building a culture of burnout. And that's not only going to undermine the flourishing of your people, their performance is going to suffer as the quality of their attention and focus drops and their energy drains. Your ability to retain them is going to fall over time as they, usually the most talented ones, empirically are the ones who leave first because they have the most options elsewhere. And so if you, you know, if you start running people into the ground, um, burning the midnight oil, 
Um, mm -hmm. You're going to lose your superstars before anybody else leaves. Yeah. And then that's going to become your company's brand and reputation. And it's going to be really hard to attract great people in the future. So um, I, I guess my message is if you want people to flourish, you actually have to value them as human beings. Who knew? <laughs> you know, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking how relevant this idea of, uh, you know, you're talking about focus on their well-being and focus on performance. So being respectful and being demanding, how important that is also for raising children. Because I think somewhere in, um, in, in, in our culture, we have lost sight of the importance of both. And people take sides. I'm in that camp, you know, well-being camp, you know, I just want them to be happy. Or I'm in that camp, you know, I want them, you know, the tiger mom, I want them to be successful and, and you know, do what they can do, all, be all that they can be. And the combination is so very important. Yeah, I think so too. I think that you know, it's, it's actually interesting that this is one of the clearest parallels between parenting research and leadership research, that that ability to be both demanding and supportive shows up in both, um, in both contexts. And I've long, I've long um, seen evidence that, uh, you know, when either a child or an employee lets you down, what a lot of leaders and parents do is they get angry. And what they forget is that anger elicits defensiveness. Um, you know, when, when I get mad at you, I'm saying you have wronged me and I'm blaming and shaming you. And what most people do is they either put up their guard or they retreat. The much more effective emotion to express turns out to be disappointment. Um, you let me down, which reinforces I had high expectations of you and I still mm. have high expectations of you. And we know part of the power of expressing disappointment is it cultivates a, uh, a little bit of guilt, which I think Irma Bombeck put it best when she said, guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I always found that hilarious, but there's also some truth to it, right? We know that, that guilt actually evolved as a moral emotion because mm -hmm. it encourages us to right wrongs, because it drives us to think about who we've hurt and how we can help them. And it's actually a healthy thing to experience in small doses. Um, now, I think a lot of us over-internalize it um, or convert it into, into shame, which is maybe another conversation. But I think the, the idea of saying as a leader or a parent, um, you want to be very clear about what your high expectations are. And you want to be equally clear when they're not met. Um, there's nothing wrong with the people around you then feeling a little bit guilty that they disappointed you. And that becomes then a message to their future self to say, whatever mistake I made here, I don't want to repeat that mistake. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I'm thinking back to a book that has that had a lot of impact on my parenting, and that is uh, Heim Ginot, Between Parents and Children. And um, it's a book that was later uh, taken by his students, Maslish and Faber, and turned into a, a best-selling book book called how to something like how to talk so children will listen and listen so the children uh, will talk and um, the whole paradigm the idea had a really impacted uh, my my thinking on parenting and uh, it's a book that very much is about uh, acknowledging appreciating uh, children their emotions and one of the anecdotes that Heim Ginot, again, the, the, the master psychologist, the, you know, arguably the, the greatest child psychologist of the 20th century, says the following. He says, he sometimes says to his children, said, I'm so angry now. I'm so upset now that I'm just going to leave and we're going to talk about this later. And the reason why I like that is because he's not saying I'm always calm and calculated and I'm always, you know, together. Uh, I get angry. I get upset. The thing is, I know what to do when I'm upset. I'm not going to scream at you. I'm not going to do something that I will regret later. I'm simply going to come back later. And then we're going to deal with, with this. So it's uh, the acceptance, the permission to experience the emotion, and yet to take um, the, the healthy or healthier path. That, that tracks so nicely with... Um, okay. Brad Bushman's new meta-analysis of what, what techniques are effective for regulating anger, uh, where if you look across, uh, this is an analysis of, of hundreds of experiments, you see that, um, that people who, who kind of take the venting approach 
uh, where you know they they hit a punching bag or they scream to let it out. Um, not only does that not help, in some cases it intensifies their anger um, because it increases their arousal level. And the more effective strategies for managing anger are to do things that that lower arousal, um, which would include um, distraction, uh, which would include um, taking some time to mm -hmm. to step away from it. And that's not denying the anger, right? It's kind of allowing it to flow through you, so you have a more constructive way to respond to it. And I, I do think that's for me. It's one of the most interesting lessons of emotional intelligence research is that. Um, people who are really good at regulating their emotions um, are often, um, they're often more, they're often experiencing them more intensely in the moment. Um, but they're also acutely aware of what that experience is and what impact it has on other people. And then they manage that impact by saying, okay, I, yes, I want to express this emotion, but I don't want to express it in a way that is, that's going to hurt you or us. Mm. Yeah. So man managing emotions is not uh, getting rid of emotions. Um, so Adam, what, what are you most excited about exploring these days? Uh, what's your research, uh, about personally, professionally? So many topics I'm excited about. My, I mean, honestly, my biggest frustration is there aren't enough hours in the day to explore all the things that I want to explore. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's hard to choose just one, but I'll, I'll tell you something I'm curious about right now, um, which speaks to both the leadership and, and parenting topic. Um, I've become really enamored with research on what uh, sociologist Gregory Elliott first called mattering. Um, actually, I think it, it grew out of some of the Rosenberg self-esteem work, um, but but Elliott put, put some teeth in, in the concept. And the basic idea of mattering is it's a sense that we all crave. Um, you might even consider it a fundamental human motivation to feel that you're seen and appreciated by other people. And I like, I actually like the term mattering much better than a lot of its cousins. Um, I can't stand the need to be needed. Um, I don't know about you. I want other people to value me. I do not want them to need me because then they depend mm. on me and they expect me to answer their calls regardless of what I'm doing. Um, and they're really upset when I didn't drop everything for them. Um, whereas I think when I feel valued, um, I, I feel like I can engage with people on terms that are mutually acceptable uh, as opposed to, to out of balance. Um, I don't love the term belonging either because it ends up being um, really easy to, to bleed into in-group, out-group dynamics that seem like tribal polarization. Um, but mattering, mattering is something that everyone seeks. It's something that, that everybody seeks in a relationship, in a family, in a company, in a team. And so I've been thinking a lot about how do we make other people feel that they matter and how do we gain that sense ourselves? And I'll tell you a quick story um, and then interested to see where it will go. Um, gosh, I was getting ready to give my first TED Talk. Um, so this was back in 2016. And I was just pacing around my house, a little frantic and jittery. And um, our oldest daughter was eight at the time. And, and this must have looked like extremely weird behavior because I'm I'm sitting there repeating these lines over and over again. And, <laughs> And she's, what are you doing? And I, I explained that I was preparing for a big speech and I was nervous about it. And I don't know what made me think to do this, but I asked her if she had any advice for managing my anxiety. <laughs> and she said, well, why don't, why, don't you, why don't you pick someone in the front row who you know and make sure they're smiling and make eye contact with them? And, you know, that'll reassure you. And you know, it's so interesting, it didn't occur to me, a bunch of my friends were gonna be at the conference and I hadn't thought to ask them to sit in the front row and also hadn't thought to make sure that one of the more, one of the friendlier, more agreeable ones uh, was there as opposed <laughs> to somebody who might be a little more curmudgeonly. And um, so I did it and it really helped. Like I, I remember just in the first minute, looking at that person, seeing their smile and thinking, okay, there's one person in this room who, believes that I'm gonna give a good talk and um, and is cheering for me. And mm. it, it really lowered my anxiety level. So a couple weeks later, um, Joanna, our, our eight-year-old was in a school play and uh, she's probably even more introverted than I am and definitely shyer than I am. And she was worried about the play. She didn't like the idea of being on stage. So old me would have just given her a bunch of tips 
But now I was, I was in a position to actually tell her to pay attention to her own advice. And I said, hey, remember when I was worried about that speech, what did you tell me to do? And she said, oh, I need to look for a smiling face in the audience. Wow. And of course, Allison and I, my wife volunteered to be those faces and we, we showed up and we were sitting there smiling and I watched her look at us and it was like the sun came out. Uh, she was just beaming and she gave a great performance. Wow. And that was the beginning of her starting to come out of her shell. And I think the, the lesson that I took away from that was uh, so much for me of helping as, as a parent, helping a child feel that they matter is giving them unconditional love and listening to them and supporting them. But it wasn't until then that I realized part of helping Joanna feel that she mattered was also showing her that other people could rely on her, right? That she made mm -hmm. a difference. And when I happened to ask her for that bit of advice, I was telling her, I have confidence in your suggestions. I want to learn from you. And then she had that confidence to carry over to the school play, knowing that I believed in, in her capability. And I guess where, where this has landed me now is I would love to study, like, is one of the ways that we help people feel that they matter by asking them for help, by seeking their advice and giving them a chance to make a difference. And that was a very long answer to your question, and I will mm -hmm. give shorter ones moving forward. No, no, uh, please, please don't uh, feel compelled to. Um, I love the story. It's uh, it's so moving, and I could feel that it's uh, moving to you when you when you tell it, even through uh, through Zoom. So thank you for that. Um, you know um, the, the the idea of mattering. Um, that um, you know, Elliot talked about it first, um, and then uh, Isaac uh, Prolitensky from uh, University of Miami uh, has um, has has written about um, is so central, so key in organizations, and of course, as your example exemplifies uh, in um, in parenting that uh, it's almost, it's not, but it's almost synonymous with, uh, with a happy life. Because a life where we feel that we, that, that we matter is, um, and again, you know, in, in Man's Search for Meaning, um, you know, Viktor Frankl, you know, indirectly spoke about this, uh, this as well. It's, it's almost synonymous with a, with a happy life. So I'm very, very much looking forward to seeing what you, uh, what you discover, uncover, and, and share with us. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so every Thursday, Adam, we get together, um, when I say we, the Happiness Studies Academy, we get together for a webinar where uh, I start by sharing something that, that I go through or have been going through or I'm excited about. And then we spend another you know, 80 minutes or so uh, with uh, just having a conversation, mostly, you know, questions or or um, our um, uh, community shares, you know, people share what they've been going through. And today, the topic that we uh, addressed was uh, hedonic adaptation. And, um, you know, when you think of hedonic adaptation, and for those of you not familiar with the, with the concept, it's basically the idea that we uh, naturally adapt, get used to both good things and bad things. So um, the uh, seminal study from the you know the seventies uh, by you know Philip Brickman about lottery winners experiencing ecstasy when they win the lottery and then very quickly after um, uh, reverting back to where they were before or uh, people who experienced an accident and uh, became paraplegic initially uh, experiencing a real drop in their well being and then. Uh, returning to base level, to the set point where they were before. So um, for good and ill, we are resilient. Now, ever since that article came out, you know, it's been uh, um, under, uh, you know, criticism or, or attack. And, and, and there's been uh, research uh, that argues otherwise. So I'm very curious to know what do you think of a hedonic adaptation? And if you can also make it personal, do you experience hedonic adaptation? And if so, how do you deal with it? 
All right. Well, let's uh, let's try to tackle it from both angles. So um, I actually published a paper in the past year with, with some colleagues on this very question where we looked at whether it's possible to sustainably increase your happiness at work. So this was research led by Justin Berg and Amy Resneski. Um, Justin's a great scholar of creativity. Amy, you know her work well on job crafting and jobs, careers, and callings. Um, one of, I think, the great scholars of our time. Um, we, uh, we went to a Fortune 500 tech company uh, that may or may not make a search engine. And we were... <laughs> We were interested in the the question of um, you know what what can what can people do to boost their own happiness and how do we make sure that that's not fleeting? And we saw basically that there were there were two competing ideas for what might help there. Um, one idea was was anchored in Carol Dweck's uh, arguments about growth mindset that if you want to improve your own happiness in your job or in any situation in life that you need to believe that first and foremost, you are capable of growing. Um, and if you can't change, it's really hard to change your emotions. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's, um, let's teach people to have a stronger growth mindset and to see possibilities for change that lots of us overlook. And then another idea which came out of Amy's work on job crafting was, well, not only do people sometimes um, inaccurately believe that their, their own traits and qualities are fixed, but also sometimes we see our own job descriptions as fixed when in fact they're malleable. Um, we, we get to make choices every day about what tasks we prioritize and who we interact with um, and how we spend our time. And so what if we taught people to teach, to see their jobs as a flexible set of building blocks and then make adjustments like to prioritize tasks that align with their values or um, spoke to their passions or that allowed them to use their strengths more effectively. Um, and basically look for opportunities for job crafting. So we wanted to run a horse race to pit these two against each other and say, what's more effective for increasing your happiness? To see yourself as malleable or to see your job as malleable? Hmm. And we ran the experiment and we invited, uh, we had a peer control group and then we had some people who were thinking about their own growth, other people thinking about the, the evolution they wanted to make in, in what they did at work. And we found that growth mindset alone had no effect on happiness whatsoever. Wow. But that if we taught people to think about their jobs as malleable and then become active architects of what they did every day, for the next six weeks, they got a spike in happiness. And then it faded out, just mm -hmm. like the Brickman et al. work would have predicted. And we didn't have a clear sense of why until we looked at a third condition that we ran, which was when we asked people to both develop a growth mindset and about themselves and about their job. Uh, so they did both of those simultaneously. They thought about how they could evolve and also about how they wanted to change their work. Guess what? That group got a sustainable boost in happiness for the full six months that we tracked them after the experiment. Wow. And I think I think that was that was for me an aha moment because I realized that so much of, of the advice we get is, is about having to create change from within or having to create change um, in our external environments. Um, but as Bandura probably captured well in his work on agency, it's the dynamic interplay between trying to change yourself and adapt your environment um, that allows for, for sustainable change. Um, I think George Bernard Shaw actually probably put it best uh, when he, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase, but he said that the, the reasonable person um, adapts themselves to the world, the unreasonable person adapts the world to themselves. And therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. <laughs> and I think the reality is, if we want to boost our happiness and we want it to stay, um, we need to be simultaneously reasonable and unreasonable. And what we saw with the, with the tech people in our study was when they thought about just changing themselves, um, they were limited in how much adjustment they could make because they still had to do a daily routine that was part of their work. And when they just tried to change their jobs, they temporarily created a more motivating job and then it got a little bit repetitive and boring and they reverted back to baseline. When we gave them the opportunity to think about changing both simultaneously, they were able to plan major changes to their skills. They were able to think of, of big ways to use their strengths that allowed them to create a much more redesigned and reimagined job. And mm -hmm. I think that's been one of the big lessons from the literature on, um, on the, tre the hedonic treadmill is, um, 
basically, if you want to, if you want to get in a situation where your, your happiness doesn't spike up and then drop again, um, you need to create a, a steady process of change um, so that you're, you know, you're always introducing novelty into your routine. And I think once people realize, hey, I can become an agent of change in my own job, and I can also evolve who I am, they were able to continue crafting their jobs as opposed to just on a one-time basis say, here's the job I want to be doing, and now I'm tired of that. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and that, of course, Adam, relies on so much of the work uh, in, in our field. You know, I'm thinking um, the book that we were both uh, raised on, uh, The Person and the Situation, Ross and Nisbet. The person and the situation, the genius of the ant strikes once more. Again. Uh, it's yes. Everywhere. And, um, and um, you know, we had uh, Amy on uh, this uh, very uh, podcast a, a few weeks ago, and uh, her work on, uh, on, jo on uh, job crafting is so important and so valuable. And when you combine it with, uh, um, with Dweck's work, then it seems like it's uh, it's much more than a than a one plus one. Um, wow! All right, so I have so many questions, but we need to open it up for uh, uh, questions from the audience. So yes, please put your hand up um, if you have a question. And uh, one final question, Adam. Oh, what does your typical day, if such a thing exists? What does your typical day look like? I definitely don't have a typical day. Um, my routine is to avoid a steady routine, um, in part because I, I think my, my default is to be too linear. And so part of me figuring out how to be creative is making sure I'm not stuck in the same rut every day. Um, I think I have some, some prototypes of good days, and I try to mix and match them. So... Um, on, a, on a good writing day, um, I'll wake up in the morning, our kids go to school, and then I sit down and, and write for a few hours until I run out of ideas or energy. Um, and then I go to the gym. And then I come back and catch up on everything that I've been behind on. Um, I think on a, a speaking day, what I'll typically do is um, I'll try to get all my work done in the morning, um, and then do whatever is, is necessary on stage in the afternoon when I feel like um, I've kind of warmed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like Paul Graham's idea of separating time between maker days and manager days. And so I, I really try to, to keep those things separate in the sense that um, I know as especially as an introvert, this is something that Brian Little taught us both. Um, I'm very prone to, to getting overloaded. And if, if I try to write or, um, or think or even analyze data um, after I've been in the spotlight uh, or delivered a high energy presentation, um, the quality of my, of my thinking suffers a lot. Um, and so I try to do a lot of my creative work in the morning um, and then you know whatever administrative work um, or collaborative work I have to do, I save that for later. Hmm. So I, I think in a sense you're applying the research that you have just conducted about not having a typical day is changing it around, keeping it interesting. And uh, I know that you have read Carol Dweck, so you're also applying that. And the combination uh, averts the uh, the hedonic uh, treadmill. Sometimes. Sometimes. And when he doesn't, you accept and move on. Adam, okay, this was uh, fascinating, and I could continue for uh, many more hours, but we'll call on uh, our uh, community to ask uh, their questions. And why don't we start with uh, Vale? Hi, um, it's so nice to be here. I was so excited uh, about this conversation. I'm Tao's student. And a big fan of your work, Adam. And I have a question. What do you think about approaching uh, happiness, understood as this long-term well-being, as a personal responsibility? Ooh, well, thank you. Um, I, I, I have mixed reactions to the idea, honestly. I think as a parent, I love it. 
I want to teach my kids that their happiness is not mine to create. It's theirs to create. Um, I've watched a lot of parents say, it's my job to make my kids happy. No, it's not your job. It's your job to teach your kids the skills to find their own happiness. I think that's a critical distinction. I, I think my hesitation around this is, um, I guess it it devolves into neoliberalism pretty quickly, where um, treating happiness solely as a personal responsibility, I think can lead us to overlook the, the important role that institutions play um, in shaping the opportunities that people have to pursue their happiness. And so I want leaders to take responsibility for people's happiness in their workplaces. Um, I want governments to feel that the policies they, they implement, um, that part of what they're accountable for um, is trying to elevate happiness, not just foster economic growth. And so um, I want, I guess what I, what I would say is ideal for me is, is to say that um, managing your own happiness is, your, is primarily your responsibility, um, but there are also other individuals and groups that have responsibilities that affect your happiness. Mm -hmm. So once again, take personal agency, the person, and also the situation matters, the um, the external environment. Thank you, Thank Vali. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steph. Hi, yes. Um, I am also a TELUS student, and I work with him in the MA, and I'm super, super excited to be here. Um, I would love to know Brené Brown's take on your take about belonging. I'm just like putting it that out there. Uh, but also my question has to do with um, your thoughts on weaknesses or struggling, because I remember I heard uh, a podcast. I can remember where you were talking, if it was Andrew Huberman, um, I don't know, David Goggins, but you were talking about your story with um, diving. Um, and how hard it was for you and how um, sometimes positive psychology or the science of happiness may focus too much on what it works and how important it is also to address what is hard for us. So I would love to hear a little bit more about this because I do think we talk a lot about, okay, this is going great, let's strengthen this, but how can we take advantage of the opportunities we also have to work with what is not easy for us? Thanks, Steph. This is so fun. First of all, um, Brene and I are recording our next podcast with Simon Sinek, uh, I think a month from tomorrow. So I'm going to raise this question um, and I'm going to I'm going to see how much she vomits over my hot take on belonging. Um, uh, I think uh, it's going to be fun. Um, OK, in terms of in terms of your question. Um, yeah, look, I think I've I've long had an allergic reaction to anything that seems to me that it's motivated by preaching answers as opposed to asking questions. And um, in many ways, this was the inspiration for, for my book, Think Again, was you know it confronting a lot of people who basically took positive psychology as Kool-Aid and thought everyone in the world should drink it in unlimited quantities. And that just did not, that didn't resonate with the scientist in me. I was like, well, Surely there are costs of positive experiences and benefits of negative experiences. We need to pay more attention to those. And I think, you know, I guess part of the reason I was I was struck by that was um, in diving for me, and I think Tal, you had this experience as well in squash. Um, there were times when I definitely needed the encouragement of a coach um, and I was down on myself. I was too self-critical. Um, I lacked self-compassion. I was kind of a... Um, a perfectionist who thought that beating myself up was the, the answer to personal growth. And that was a great way to burn myself out. Um, but those days were mostly when I was a novice. And this is something that Ayelet Fishbach has shown in her research is that novices crave praise, but experts seek criticism. Um, that when, when you're new to a task, um, you really wanna know that you can do it. You need somebody to encourage you and build you up and, and express confidence. At some point, you realize I'm pretty good. Um, and I'm capable of getting better. And at that point, you're no longer obsessed with finding out that you can do it. You want to know how you can do it better. And I think that sometimes positive psychology overlooks that and it does it to our own detriment. I think one of the places where I see that really concretely is um, in Rob Kaiser's research on uh, looking at, at, um, at leadership strengths. 
where he shows that um, overusing or misusing a strength is a career derailment. So one of the ways that, that you can, I, I see this almost every day, is a leader who has a lot of charisma. Well, that person's gotten a ton of positive reinforcement for giving brilliant speeches and being excellent at making connections with other people. And that serves them really well until they start overdoing it. And then they dominate every meeting and don't listen to other people and learn from them. They show up unprepared because they're good at winging it until the day they couldn't afford to do that. And so what I want people to do there is to say, let's identify your strengths, but we don't wanna just develop them to the point that they're the only thing you use. We wanna ask, um, what is the cost of your strength overused? And what is the situation where it's not appropriate? And if we do that, I think we can balance what you're good at with what you need to get better at. And um, that for me is uh, is what positive psychology should be aiming at. Yeah, finding that balance, which, which is not easy because it is so attractive for people to think, okay, so I've found the holy grail. I found the secret, you know, just think positive uh, and everything will work itself out. And um, that, that that's not the path to uh, to flourishing. Thank you. And thank you, Steph, for your question. Uh, Luciana. Hi, um, Tao and hi, Adam. Um, thank you very much for your wise words and sharing. Um, I'm also a tall student and um, I mostly work in organizational well-being here in Spain, in the south of Spain. And um, I love your work. I love some of your books that I've read. And I also really like um, Arthur Brooks. And there is a question I have for you that has to do with something that him and Oprah said um, on their presentation of their last book, no? Um, I think it was Oprah that said that um, I'm an American myself and she was talking about the good life versus the sweet life, no? And um, and she was saying, you know, uh, you don't, you, you, there's a big number of people in the world that no longer wants just the good life, right? The car, the house, the kids, and but a sweet life, a life that allows you to be present, but also to have your priorities, you know, well balanced. And I was wondering, um, if you had like a crystal ball, do you think that let's say 10 or 20 years from now, that idea is gonna be also changing in the organization? Meaning the organization has been wanting productive people and people who wanted, you know, impactful leaders. And I'm just wondering Fantastic. in the future, we're gonna be talking about organizations that want balanced people, people already come happier, et cetera, et cetera. And what would you call that, no? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I definitely hope so. Um, so a few a few reactions. Um, first reaction is, I think that organizations are already moving in this direction a little bit. So in the US, um, the prevalence of the four day work week has tripled uh, in the last few years, tripled. Um, this is uh, brand new evidence from a group of economists. And I think that the four day work week is an example of the push for greater balance. Um, and a desire among a lot of people, um, and I think Gen Z gets a lot of credit for this, um, to, to say, look, I don't want to organize my life around work. I want to fit my work into my life. I think we still have a lot of leaders who don't get it, um, which is why I've been involved in some research lately to actually test the effects of the four-day work week and ask mm -hmm. whether it's possible to be happier um, and just as productive uh, while either working less or condensing it more. Um, and I think the tentative answer from the evidence is it does seem to be doable because most of us don't focus our best attention eight hours a day. Um, and it's possible then to, to actually do, do just as much in less time. Um, I think that's, that's encouraging. And Juliet Shore has published some great research on this lately with some trials. Um, I think that the other part of this question, which I've, I've talked with Arthur and Oprah about a little bit is like, what, what does it mean to have a good life? And I, I really like the, the Shigehiro Oishi take that's, um, that's really come into research in the last few years, which is to say, we used to just say it was about feeling good, like traditional definitions of happiness. 
And then we added meaning and said, yeah, we want to matter too. Um, we want life to be important and worthwhile and not just fun and pleasurable. And what Oishi and colleagues show is that there's a third pillar that a lot of people seek um, that I wonder if this is also part of what's behind the desire for balance is um, what they call an interesting life, a rich life. Um, they talk about psychological richness as having novel experiences, as seeking growth. And a lot of you have already talked about this idea, I'm sure. Um, and that, that to me might be the best way to, to frame what we're after to say, yeah, we, we want joy, we want mattering, um, and we also want richness. We want to have experiences mm -hmm. that allow us to grow and, um, and encounter new things. Um, and maybe, maybe that is a way to move us toward a healthier balance um, in our workplaces and beyond. But I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great addition, the richness. Um, thank you, Luciana. F. Philip, the floor is yours. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right. So I'm Philip. Hello. And uh, I'm uh, concerned with putting into practice what you researched. Paul taught us about the giver and the taker. And that on the top of the organization, we find the giver. On the bottom of the organization, we find the giver. The difference is that the giver gives himself. Uh, gives to himself and uh, in in practice, uh, how could I imagine it? Could I imagine it the following way? If I produce one hundred dollars, uh, the best would be uh, to produce fifty for the organization and fifty for myself. Versus uh, producing one hundred dollars for the organization, which is less good. Would you would you uh, agree with that more or less? I think I might. Um, I think that, yeah, I think, look, when I've, I feel like there are a lot of misconceptions about what it means to be a giver and a taker. And I, I should have been clearer in this, in my, um, in my early writing and speaking. So I think about this as a spectrum of styles of interaction. And in the research, what you see is that you could think about giving, taking, and also this middle style of matching um, as basically how you treat most of the people most of the time. Um, what's your instinct? What's your default way of interacting? And so givers are people who, who default to trying to figure out what can I do for you? Takers are people who, who have the opposite question. What will you do for me? And matchers are people who are worried about being too selfish or too generous. And so they choose the norm of reciprocity and say, I'll do something for you if you do something for me. I think that people have mistaken then what it means to be a giver as saying, well, the, the more you give, like the, the more generous you are. And I think the danger of that is you end up self-sacrificing and that's what your example surfaces, Phil. Um, I think we, we know now from a large body of evidence that what failed givers do is they end up being too selfless um, and they end up neglecting their own needs and not giving to themselves. Um, and then people say, well, then isn't, isn't being a productive giver just being a matcher? No, it's not. A matcher wants something back from every person they help. Uh, a selective giver is somebody who, say, who says, I will help with no strings attached whenever I can, as long as it doesn't cost me so much that I can no longer achieve my own goals and, and fulfill my own values. And that's a really different way of relating to other people. It's less transactional. Um, it's much more, I'm helping you because I care about you, as opposed to because I expect there to be some future return on my investment. And I think the great irony, of, of course, is that the people who build relationships this way do end up with more returns because they end up feeling that they matter more. They have greater impact on others. They end up learning more because they end up solving all kinds of problems for other people that bring them new knowledge. Um, and they end up also with greater reputations, um, more social capital, um, because they get known as the kind of person who not only likes helping, but actually adds value. And so I, I think this is hard to quantify in, you know, in financial terms to say like what, you know, if you're going to keep a certain amount of money or give a certain amount of money, how should that be divided? Because money seems zero sum. The way I prefer to think about it is to say that what successful givers do is they figure out where they can make a distinctive contribution. Um, what is your knowledge that nobody else has? What is your strength that's shared by relatively few people in your community or in your workplace? Um, what is the network that you have access to that other people don't? 
And how can you focus your giving on that where you excel and also hopefully are energized? Um, and that means you're making more of a difference at the same time um, that you're able to uh, to feel the kind of the 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 helper's high or the the warm glow of altruism, um, as it's often called in the literature, as opposed to just feeling constantly depleted by it. Um, I think I've seen a lot of people end up sort of discovering the hard way, like, wow, in my workplace, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> I, I don't want people to do good deeds that get punished. Um, what I want them to do is to be known as somebody with really valuable expertise and skill and connections so that people are thoughtful about the ask they make and respectful of mm. their boundaries. Thank you, Adam. Very well put. You know, the um, the work on uh, givers, matchers and takers uh, has had a lot of impact on, on me personally and professionally. And I know that many of our uh, Many of our uh, community members are also very much taken by it and have gone on and applied it in their personal lives and professional lives. Sorry, I, I think I was muted. Is it possible? Anyway, uh, the point, uh, what for me is interesting, uh, it's so unfair. No? The person who gives a lot, uh, gives $100. I, I know not dollars isn't exactly precise, but it's uh, very uh, easily felt a uh, dollar. We know what a dollar is. So uh, if the person who gives $100 is less productive than the person who gives 50 for the organization, 50 for himself as a model. I know it's not precise about the dollars, but uh, it's an injustice. It's a paradox because uh, who gives more should be should be more productive because the person who gives $100 to the organization is less productive for the organization and less productive for himself. Whereas the one who gives 50 to the organization and 50 to himself is more productive both for the organization and for himself. So that that's where I think it depends on how you give. Right. So if your idea of giving to the organization is you um, are showing up to arrange the chairs for the meeting um, and cleaning up afterward, if people have made a mess, your contribution is less strategic than if you're sharing some knowledge that helps people solve a major problem. And that that's why I think it's so important to emphasize the idea of um, not not just, you know, sort of what are people asking of you? But rather, um, where is the place where you can make the most unique impact? Um, mm -hmm. Where is there the greatest delta when you know when you say yes or when you volunteer um, to be supportive of others? Um, where are you going to make the biggest difference? Um, and I think that if you give there, what what I've seen in in my research, and and this is true probably now in a in a meta analysis as well, um, is that the the generosity that you um, that you invest in other people. Um, is more likely to to build a, a network where people are willing to pay it forward. And you end up shifting the norm of the whole organization so that you have more givers and fewer takers in the, the population. And that really matters, right? Because if you are a giver in an environment full of takers, people will take advantage of you. Um, and that is a recipe for burnout um, or just being exploited uh, until you, you feel like you have nothing left to give. Whereas if you can build an environment where more people are giving, it means you don't have to field every request yourself. It means when somebody needs something, you can find the best expert or the most connected person. Um, and maybe they're a giver, maybe they're a matcher and they're doing it to repay the help that you've given them in the past. Um, but either way, it, it doesn't all fall on your shoulders. And so I really want people to think about this as, um, as a chance to model a kind of behavior that makes their time valuable and encourages other people to follow that model and change the norms in their in their environment. Right. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Supriya. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Supriya. I am it's it's an absolute fangirl moment for me right now because uh I am I am a big, big fan of your work, Adam. And I'm and in fact I'm sort of rereading your book again. Um, but um, very quickly, I run an organization that's based in India where we work with young people, helping them make pro-planet choices, which means they, they work a lot with underserved communities. And um, a big conversation in our learning rooms um, in the last year or so has been about building resilience for for being joyful or being happy every day. Because this this obviously this, this um, one piece about how much are you contributing to change and a lot of work that they do is the challenges that they work on is very systemic in nature and therefore you don't see the result of your work 
um, in a week, in a quarter, in a year. So, uh, um, so um, I'm sorry, I'm so excited and I'm so nervous right now, <laughs> being like very coherent about what, I'm, what I want to ask. But um, do you have any thoughts or um, ideas on how how do we enable young people who are working on challenges um, especially a lot of climate climate related challenges something that they have not contributed for contributed towards and they like it's it's not because of because of them and they're having to deal with it now when a lot of result of their work is not something that they get to see um but they but they have to sort of keep at it um and a lot of it a big part of it is wanting to do good for the community wanting to do good for underserved communities but that's not a driver for a long time um and we want to be able to to help them build the sort of resilience or lens or to see that to, to find joy and happiness in the work that they're doing in their communities especially when they come back to the learning rooms and enabling rooms with us in our organization and sort of the reflections and the debriefs and et cetera, sort of, um, there's, there's a lot of inspiration and there's a lot of, uh, but but we feel that there isn't enough happiness in the rooms and the work that they're doing. Do you have any thoughts or insights on that? Yeah, thanks, Supriya. Um, first of all, honored that my work has resonated. Um, I, my kids will, will get a real kick out of it. I with everybody, like, like, like Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, no, my, my kids find it hilarious that anyone reads or listens to me. So um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be mentioning this at dinner later. Um, I think I have, a, I have a few thoughts on this, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to be briefer in my answers because I see there are a lot of hands. Um, first thing is Rebecca Solnit wrote a beautiful book called Hope in the Dark about her experiences uh, trying to fight climate change. And uh, she's, I think, one of the, the greatest writers uh, of the last century and highly, highly recommend um, Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit, for those of you who are taking notes. Um, second thought is, um, this is a problem I studied a version of early in my career um, when I was, I was studying fundraising callers who were bringing in money for a university, and they had no idea where the money went. And I designed a simple intervention where they just got to hear from one scholarship student who was able to attend university because of their work. And the average caller more than doubled in weekly minutes on the phone per week and nearly tripled in weekly revenue afterward, just from seeing one person who was helped by their work. And I think that you know this is, this is all the more important when you're solving such a, an intractable, long-term abstract problem like climate change, um, that you need to know who's benefiting from your work. And maybe feeling that like you've saved the planet is not something that you're gonna get in your career um, and it's too big. And so I think Carl Weick in his classic paper on the on small wins uh, would say that we need to look for the small wins. So what do those look like in, in work on, on climate change? I think number one, I would think about the other people that they help. Um, how did they make a coworker's job easier? Um, who did they mentor? Um, and look for the local impact that they're having. Um, whose mind did they change? Uh, maybe there's a climate denier or resistor who now they brought on board. And then the other thing I would do for small wins is I think counterfactual thinking is a vital skill to be able to imagine how much worse would the world be and how much worse off would my community be if our organization didn't exist, if our jobs didn't exist, if we weren't doing this work. And the more clearly you can paint that picture, the easier it is to remember, hey, there are a lot of people who need us and rely on us and count on us. Um, and this work really matters. And it's <laughs> the impact is invisible by definition. Um, and so we need to be able to think about what would be worse as opposed to how much better we're making things. All right, who's next? So um, Adam, bef before we move on, you know, as you're talking about your research uh, with the fundraisers at the university, um, the impact that that meeting with a student had on them is that they suddenly realized that their work matters and that they matter. And um, that uh, obviously contributed to their you know, sense of meaning and purpose and their work experience. And it made them more effective, more successful and what they did. Yeah, that's a great connection to draw. Thank you. So uh, Whitney, 
Hi, I want to give you a hug. Um, I'm so <laughs> thankful to be here. Tell I miss you. Adam, I love all of your work. I'm also a reader of all the books and many times over. So my question is, um, how are you personally integrating the lessons that you get from all of the research that you've done, the papers you've written, the books that you've written, it, especially I'm curious about in your family and these kids who like, you know, you talk about at the dinner table or like, who's listening to you? How do you get them to listen to <laughs> you with what you have learned and, um, and, you know, carry that forward, especially as you go through like these rabbit holes where you've got one focus for a while and that's the thing. And then you move on to the next thing. And then like now, you know, it's mattering keeps coming up and I'm wondering like, you know, are you taking it as you go and actively saying like around the dinner table, like plugging little, little things in? Are you doing things with their schools? Like, how does that work in your life? Thank you. Thanks, Whitney. My, my major goal is to minimize the number of times they roll their eyes at me. So that's, that, that, that's, that's my <laughs> micro metric of, of how am I doing as a parent? I, I think that let me, let me give you two examples um, that hopefully address the question of, of things that I found really powerful. Um, the first one comes from, from my give and take work. Um, Allison and I sat down early on and said, um, you know, we want, we want our kids to prioritize kindness. But so many of the conversations we have when they get home from school are about like, how did the test go? What grade did you get? And you know, then on the weekend, it's like, well, how many goals did you score in soccer? And everything is about achievement because that's what we measure. And we said, okay, we need to change that dynamic. So we, we started every Friday night asking a different question, which was, who did you help this week? And we noticed that it was a chance for them to talk about like, their kind of daily experiences of trying to be givers. And the examples that were really small in a lot of cases, like, um, you know, I saw someone in the hallway who was lost and I, I showed them where to go. Um, or, you know, a friend didn't understand an idea um, in class and I explained it. But we noticed that the examples got bigger as we started doing this because they knew they were going to be asked over the course of the week and they started looking for opportunities to help mm. at school. And then Allison had this idea that I thought was completely backward. She said, we should also ask who helped them. And I was like, no, I want them to be, them to be givers, not takers. And I was completely wrong because she said, I want them to pay attention to who helps them because mm. I want them to be friends with the kindest kids in class, not just the coolest kids in class. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, when we asked them who helped them, we heard different names than the kids they usually talked about. And as they realized, wow, that is actually somebody who really cares about other people, it started to change who they sought out as friends. So that's that's one favorite. The other that we've done more recently is um, this really grew out of um, out of Think Again. I, I published some research a couple of years ago about um, how it helps for leaders when they're they're trying to seek feedback to not just ask for it, but to talk about what they're trying to get better at, and that's part of how they they humanize themselves and um, and show that they can handle the truth. And one day we decided to do that with our kids, and we actually sat down at dinner and. Um, and Allison and I each said something we thought we could do better as a parent. And then we asked our kids how they thought we could improve. And they had really great notes. And I felt like they were starting to coach us on how to become more effective parents. And then we made a commitment to how we wanted to get better. And then they would check in with us and say like, hey, you know, you said you were going <laughs> to like, be a little more patient with us and it's not happening right now. Uh, and I, I love that. And for me, it's it's a great example, again, of, of trying to role model um, what I want them to do. I want them to ask how they can improve. I want them to focus on growth and what better way to instill those values than to to show that I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to live that. Yeah. And I think there, there is an important lesson here for teaching in general. Uh, we don't always need to tell very often. Uh, we need to ask a question that will elicit a quest. Uh, or, of course, to exemplify that which we want to teach. Thank you. That's what I should have said. Yes. <laughs> yes, and. Thank you. Karen. Hello, and thank you so, so much for this opportunity. I am a newly enrolled student in happiness studies. 
and loving it. Um, and everything that you've said today about parenting and kids and what you just touched on about prioritizing kindness as a value for your children to you know, seek out with that question, who have you helped and who has helped you? That's really powerful to me. A lot of people have touched on what I initially raised my hand to ask, which is, you know, hearkening back to Whitney Houston, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Um, we are living right now in a climate of extreme mental health challenges for youth especially. My child, my youngest, has grappled with mental health, anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempt. And I think what I want to hear you talk a little bit about is it can be so daunting and overwhelming living in the world that we're living in. And when we think about happiness and focusing on happiness or trying to guide ourselves to look for ways to improve our happiness quotient. Um, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed, especially for children. And so I'm wondering, just in terms of guiding our kids, you know, in school, we talked about it today. In fact, we were focusing on Carol Dweck's work in growth mindset today, you know, I think that schools tend to pigeonhole us. Marketing tends to pigeonhole us. To, it's, a, it's a control thing. And so we're, we're taught to color in the lines, but where the growth and expansion and development comes is those who dare to dabble outside the lines. And as a parent, I think it's, it's one of the things that I'm prioritizing with my children, but I am also a product of coloring within the lines. So I'm just interested to hear what you have to say on that and how we as parents can be a supportive force to our children. And what you said initially about, it's not our job to make our kids happy. It's our job to empower them and teach them the skills to find and create their own happiness. Thank you for listening. Oh, thanks, Karen. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear about the challenges you faced. And uh, I'm certainly not qualified to speak on matters of clinical psychology. Um, I think what I what I can say is when it comes to coloring inside and outside the lines, um, there's some classic research. I, I summarized it in, in one of the early chapters of Originals. Uh, showing that highly creative children tend to come from households uh, that have um, relatively small numbers of rules. And this, you know, this terrifies the, the tiger parents among us. But um, they're not they're not households without standards. Um, they're households where parents are really clear about their values um, as opposed to their rules. And I think that mm -hmm. distinction is really important. Um, and I think I've screwed this up a lot. Um, so an example of a, a rule that, that I tried to enforce early was bedtime at eight o'clock. And what does that do? That tells kids, like, I am in charge of you. Um, it leads them to feel like they don't have any freedom. They tend to experience psychological reactants, and then they want to rebel against that. And first it's, you know, my, but my friends get to stay up until nine. And then it's, but my older sibling gets to stay up until nine. And then it's, well, you know what? I'm just going to do it anyway. Um, and not effective, right? Um, a value version of that that would work much better, um, <laughs> part of the hard way, is um, we really want you to be well rested because we know that sleep is is critical to your well being, um, to your developing brain, um, to your performance in anything you care about. Um, let's talk about how many hours of sleep you actually need, and then how we can create a structure where you'll be well rested. And um, that I think is much less likely to lead kids to rebel against their parents and much more likely to get them to think for themselves about, well, how do I wanna think through this problem? 
And I think, you know, there, there are millions and millions of these tiny moments, right, where kids learn to think for themselves, as opposed to either deferring to or rebelling against authority that really matters. And I, I think that seems to be a pretty effective way to, to raise kids who are, are comfortable not just following the crowd, um, who have actually practiced thinking for themselves. There's some other interesting findings on, on the coloring outside the lines idea that um, that, that creative children also tend to grow up in families um, where there was a lot of arguing. And I'm not talking about angry fights. I'm talking about people having intense debates um, and parents sometimes even disagreeing in front of their children, which sends a clear message that there's not one right answer to every problem and normalizes the idea that we can challenge conventions. Um, and maybe even gives gives kids a chance to participate in, in those kinds of disagreements too. Um, I think that that's something that, you know, I, I always thought we were supposed to fight behind closed doors. And one of the things I've, I've learned in the last few years is I actually want our kids to see us fighting. One, so they know that like reasonable people can disagree and still respect each other. And two, so we can try to model what an effective disagreement looks like so they can learn how to resolve creative differences with other people. So. Um, Karen, I don't, I don't know that I've even scratched the surface of being at all helpful on your question, but hopefully there's something useful in there. It was super useful, and, and the question was super broad, but that was really, really helpful. The rules versus values thing. Mm -hmm. Epic. Could not agree more. Um, so we have very little time left, so if we can make the, the, the questions... Um, brief, maybe rapid fire uh, responses as much as possible. Uh, Audrey. Hi, Tao. Long time no see. <laughs> I'm Tao student uh, in the MA of Happiness Studies. And it's very nice of you and would like to give you a big hug for your sharing. So I have a question. Um, which, as I know, as the organization is something contrast to the reactivity. So um, how how to boost how to boost the employees' reactivity uh, when we saw organizational in the in the in the work like this? And because I know that the the reactivity can make amazing results. So I'm wonder how to connect and how to make it flourish both for both the organizational and the reactivity one mm. um, in one organization. And uh, the second, I would like so uh, curious about your daily life of reactivity because as I see that your book sells very beautiful as the rainbow with organization like that. <laughs> so this is my two questions. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Our twelve-year-old organized. Uh, our twelve-year-old organized my bookshelf. So uh, that's that's her doing. Um, <laughs> boosting creativity. <laughs> let me let me suggest a few resources uh, for those of you who are interested in this topic. And this will be my lightning response. Uh, number one, Teresa Mable wrote a great article, um, "How to Kill Creativity," uh, that makes a case that it's actually about removing the barriers, um, not about creating the supports, which I think is right. Um, Secondly, um, one of my all-time favorite podcast episodes we did on work life uh, is called The Creative Power of Misfits, where I went to Pixar and look at, looked at how they created um, these amazing computer animated films. And I learned a ton in that. And then um, probably my third go-to place would be um, Amy Edmondson's book, The Fearless Organization. Which once again is about creating the conditions to, uh, to elicit creativity. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey and Adam. Thank and you, Audrey, Adam if, you, and Tal. if you are indeed in Vietnam, it is very late, or rather very <laughs> early in the morning. Thank you, yes, thank you for I... being here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And uh, Jackie. You're still muted. Try once more. Hi, can you hear me okay? We got yeah, you. Well. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm loving this. So uh, I, um, I love your concept about mattering. And I'm really curious on your take, Adam, in terms of environments where 
the, the, the workload is so huge that it's naturally um, a creating environment uh, fostering burnout. So things like the exit and medics in the minute chair for teachers or the city, I'm in the UK, city in London, or really highly creative industries actually. We love the work, but it's, it's just a culture of overwork, if you will. And eventually can we do that so i'm i'm really curious on on your take on that you know whether the lead whether it's because a lot of people leave eventually or they are running out so we'll just do it for a very short time yep. so any thoughts thank you yeah thanks jackie so we we did a work-life episode a few years ago called burnout is everyone's problem where i tried to distill what we know about how to prevent or cure burnout and my favorite model from all the research is demand control support. And it says, basically, there are three ways to fight burnout. One is you reduce demands, um, give people less work, um, find out what the most stressful work is and try to spread it around. Um, but we can't always do that. So a second option is give people more control, which means they get choices about when they work, about how they get it done, about who they work with. And we try to, to give them the flexibility and freedom to manage the demands as opposed to feeling like they're being overwhelmed by them. And then the, the third piece is support, uh, which is to, to normalize doing what you need to do to manage um, whatever feelings of exhaustion people have. Um, I thought I, I saw a great example of a leader who said, it's okay to call in sick. It's also okay to call in sad. And what I loved about that was not that HR is now going to give you five sad days a year. And if you don't use them up at the end of the year, they're gone, right? It was the idea that, you know, just as you would take time off if you broke your ankle or you got the flu, if you're feeling depressed or burned out, or even if you're languishing instead of flourishing, we're going to expect you to prioritize your mental health and well-being. I think it's good for leaders to say that. I think it's even more important for them to demonstrate it. Um, I, I think leaders actually scheduling a recharge week or taking a mental health day, right? That's how you give employees permission to do it. So I think those are probably our best tools for fighting burnout. Thank you. And uh, unfortunately, the last question, uh, Christiana, no pressure. Hello, so, hi, Adam. Thank you. So building up, on, oh, Adam, building up in this last answer that you gave, we studied in the Master of the Science of Happiness about givers and takers and the antidotes for, I'm really here, my brain map, the antidotes for uh, givers is that you want. So the importance of building more assertiveness, setting boundaries and perspective thinking. Moving, how do you create the tools to produce more the right type of givers? You mentioned about leaders uh, being the role models. But what else can we foster inside the companies? Well, I think the, the single most important thing for creating, a, I think, a culture of sustainable giving um, is, is actually creating good mechanisms for help seeking. If you look at the, the research, um, a couple of things surprised me when I, when I first looked at this. The first one was Anderson and Williams um, showed years ago that 75 to 90% of all helping in organizations started with a request. So there weren't, like, there weren't a lot of people offering, it was people who were coming forward with their needs and challenges that, that, that led the givers then to, to be supportive. But a lot of people didn't ask because they didn't know where to turn or in, in many cases, um, they didn't wanna be a burden to others. The givers like to be the ones doing the helping, not the ones doing the asking. But then you have a lot of people who don't ask for help and givers are sort of lost. Like, what do I do? Who needs me? I don't know. Um, when people do ask for help, you run into a second problem, which is they tend to go to the person they know best and trust most, the person who's most available and easily accessible, instead of the person with the most relevant expertise or knowledge or skills or, um, or connections. And so what we want to do is we want to disrupt both of those problems. And we say we want to make it easy to ask for help. We want to make it easy to ask for help from people that you don't know well, but are highly qualified to solve whatever your problem is. Um, you can think about a lot of ways for doing that. My personal favorite one is called the reciprocity ring. Uh, it was invented by Wayne and Cheryl Baker. And the, the idea is that you gather a group. Um, it could be five people. It could be 500 people. You ask everyone to, to make a request for something they want or need but can't get on their own. 
And then you challenge the group to try to use their knowledge and their networks to fulfill the request. And that's the whole exercise. Everybody asks, everyone tries to give. You will see some weird requests. Let me tell you, I've run a lot of reciprocity rings. Um, one time somebody said, my dream is to see a Bengal tiger in the wild. And we're like, that's what you asked for? You could ask for anything, why that? And this guy's like, you don't understand. Growing up, I was a tiger for Halloween every year. I've always wanted to live in a world where tigers roam free. No one in the group had ever set a foot on a continent where that was possible. But a few people had ideas for leads. And a month later, this guy was flying out for a private tour of a game preserve where he got to live his lifelong wow. dream of seeing Bengal tigers in the wild. Now, unfortunately, the tigers got loot. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> never would have happened if the request hadn't been crowdsourced to a group of people with diverse knowledge and, and diverse networks. So what I like to do is um, I want to I want to have people actually make the requests um, to a wider group of people. I want to normalize that in an organization. It could be a Slack channel. Um, it could be um, a group where people meet up once a week and everybody who has a challenge or a problem is allowed to share it. And then we can then find out who's the person who's best situated to help um, instead of just who's the one person I know that might be willing to take my call or answer my email. Uh, and that is my favorite dynamic to unleash. Um, let me let me just uh, say one other thing before I forget, which is um, I, I know there are a lot of questions we didn't get to. So for those of you who have lingering questions, um, tell if you want to collect them, um, what we can do is um, I'll go through them quickly and suggest a book, article, podcast, et cetera, that might be a useful resource on the question. And um, we can share that offline with anybody who's interested. Um, and just beyond that, it's it's just been an honor to, to join you all today. Um, I appreciate uh, all of you, especially those of you who stayed up late or woke up early. Uh, y para la, la gente hispanohablante, podemos hablar en español si quieren, pero me he olvidado casi todo mi, mi vocabulario, lo siento, y mi acento es terrible ahora. Um, <laughs> Tal, really, really, really great to see you. Um, next time, I'm asking the questions. Um, please do, would be my pleasure. Thank you, Adam. And um, for those of you who still have questions, please send them to info at happinessstudies.academy and we'll uh, forward them all uh, together to uh, to Adam. Thank you for um, agreeing to do Great. that, Adam. Um, you know, before today, I was thinking uh, about the following. I was thinking, let's say we hadn't met or I hadn't seen what you do after you graduated from college. So at the age of 22, our paths would diverge and never to meet or interact again. What would I remember most from um, Adam of 18 to 22 years old? And what came up, and I don't think there is uh, the uh, the bias of, of actually knowing what you do, but I think what I would have remembered best is your generosity and kindness. So long before you wrote the book on uh, give and take on, on the giver, uh, you were a giver. And today as a scholar and a teacher and an influencer, you're still a generous and kind giver. So thank you for that and for a lot more. Oh, thank you, Tal. That means a lot to me. It's frankly a lot of pressure to live up to in the future, but <laughs> I, I will say I learned from the best and you know, also if, just to to close the loop on that exercise, if if I think about how old were you then? I think you were you were in your twenties, late twenties, maybe, uh, if I had to guess. Um, uh, so if I think about that version of you, the thing I remember the most is, um, I think the the way I would describe it is, uh, it it was wisdom on demand, that whatever question or problem or dilemma anyone had on campus. I, I remember there were like, complete strangers who would come up to you in the dining hall like you were their rabbi <laughs> uh, <laughs> or their therapist. And uh, whatever it was, you would have a study or a book to read or um, an aphorism that spoke directly to where they were. And I think watching that, um, number one, it made me want to try to learn how to do it. Um, and number two, uh, I think it's, I mean, there's no greater act of generosity than taking your knowledge and experience and making it applicable to somebody else. And 
uh, I think you've you've really blazed a trail in doing that. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And um, thank you all for being here. And as always, take good care of yourselves and others. Bye-bye. Coming to an H HSA retreat is absolutely amazing. Uh, to me, the word that comes to mind the most is connection. So the retreat has been great. We're really connecting, having lunch with people, just the conversations we're having. I actually have found a mentee that I'm going to be working with. I now have a whole bunch of new friends. It's just great. I can't wait for the next one. For me, it was uh, life-changing, knowing very authentic and generous people from all over the world just open up my imagination to so many possibilities. It makes me just want to improve in so many areas I didn't even know about. It's just a wonderful experience. It's an experience that I would recommend to anybody. This is my third retreat, and definitely I will be next year in the next retreat, uh, whatever it is. And people of HSA are really a huge family. I recommend everyone to come and to have this experience. It's a unique experience, you have to do it. There's so much packed into like three days. Yeah. And there's still more to come. The community is just unbelievably good. You get in here and you know you've got fantastic support in every which way possible. We didn't expect such a level of preparation and it is just mind-blowing, you, you, you know? They are treated, uh, treating us like princesses and princes or like I'm coming for the best um, date of my life. People hug each other, they smile to each other, they support each other, which is amazing because this is not something you can learn. Such a passion towards other people can only come if you have the happiness in your heart and that you care for other people. And the HSI community is the community of people who care for others.